Okay. If I could get your attention, we can get started. Okay. My name is, uh, my name is Greg Idry. Uh, I'm a, a senior executive with Shell. Uh, my, my former role is uh, executive vice president of our unconventionals business, which is always an interesting label. Um, it, it's basically the business where we develop shale, oil, and gas, and, um, and which creates an awful lot of discussion uh, and an awful lot of debate. Um, I'm, I've, I've actually got a personally a keen interest from a business perspective, also a personal perspective, in, in getting this business right from a sustainability perspective. Uh, this is my second year at Aspen, and, and I can tell you it provides quite a bit of insight in what getting, getting it right looks like, and, and also some ideas on how to get it right. So uh, very glad to be here, uh, glad to be here for my second year. I have the privilege today of introducing this topic. Uh, much of what I do in my business life is about supply, and it's about energy supply. Uh, our topic today is much more around energy demand and the energy demand that is going to be created and frankly the opportunity for efficiency to be created by urbanization. By the middle of this century, more than three quarters of the world's inhabitants, some six billion people, will live in cities. Urbanization can bring benefits such as innovation, collaboration, and economic development, but if managed poorly, it could lead to declining quality of life, additional greenhouse gas emissions, and social And of course, the demand for food, water, and energy, and the need to manage the intersection of those, the, the nexus, it'll only intensify. While this shift to urban living will result in the equivalent of a new city the size of Phoenix, San Diego, or Dallas every week, a handful of cities will see a path to mega development. What will be the next New York City or the next Tokyo? And what will life be like in these future mega cities? That's the discussion to be led by Greg Lindsay, senior fellow at the World Policy Institute. He's also a contributing writer for Fast Company and author of the international bestseller, Aerotropolis, The Way We'll Live Next. Greg has been cited as an expert on the future of travel, technology, and, urban, ur and urbanism, and his writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, and, and among many others. He also is a two-time Jeopardy champion <laughs> <laughs> and the only human being to go undefeated against IBM's Watson. <laughs> yeah? They're all humans. <laughs> so, so I ask myself, Will his talk be more about questions or answers? <laughs> we'll see. So please, if you please help me welcome Greg. Thank you, Greg. Thanks. I would say it's a shame I couldn't follow Andy McAfee this morning. I like to think that uh, I, I offer hope against the machines. If you went and saw his panel, um, well, thank you all for coming. I hope you all had a, uh, had an enjoyable lunch, uh, and thank you for joining us for uh, what what what's which should definitely be uh, a really fascinating uh, conversation about what I think is the most important topic driving the world today, which is urbanization for all the reasons that Greg laid out there. The, the future of humanity is, is urban. We will be an urban species. We already are. If you've already seen that old chestnut, that more than half of humanity lives in cities and that, that population percentage will rise. And you know, the great challenge of that, you know, of, the, of the increase in megacities, uh, which technically is defined as cities of 10 million or more, um, will be the challenge of absorbing them at paces at a, at a rate that has never been before seen in human history. Uh, you know, essentially millions of people moving to cities every week. Um, according to research by Solly Angel at New York University, uh, we're going to see a doubling of urban population in the next uh, 30 years, and we're going to see a tripling in urban land cover at that time. So every square inch of developed land under us will triple. And the majority of that will not be skyscrapers and will not be, you know, uh, you know, triumph of the city, it's going to be informal settlements and it's going to be slums. And the, the real challenge for humanity from an urban perspective is how we can build cities faster and better at a pace that we've never even attempted to do. And so uh, we have a perfect panel to discuss these issues today, the challenges of all three from a, from a theoretical perspective, uh, from uh, someone who grew up in a slum, and then from someone who's advising the world's governments and corporations on how to do this process. And so 
From my immediate left is Sharish is Sanka, uh, who's a director at McKinsey's Mumbai office, uh, where he supports clients in both infrastructure and public sector, and particularly uh, along with many corporations in such sectors as mining and others. Um, but it also as part of his duties, he spends a lot of his time advising the government, uh, working with them to help manage urbanism in India. Um, and he is the co-author of several publications there, including uh, McKinsey Global Institute's um, India's Urban Awakening, which includes the astounding statistic that India needs to build the equivalent of a Chicago every year for the next 20 years to absorb the urban, urban pace. Um, to his left is Kennedy Odede, uh, who is the co-founder, president, CEO of Shining Hope for Communities, uh, an NGO he founded uh, by saving, I believe the figure is 20 cents from his job paying a dollar a day. Um, he founded it in Kibera, which is the largest slum in all of Africa, uh, in Nairobi, uh, where he grew up as a child. Um, and now he basically serves 70,000 beneficiaries, um, particularly targeting uh, young girls who are the most disadvantaged uh, in the slums, of course, um, with lower wages, lower chances of ever earning a wage, high rates of sexual assault, and many others. Um, I should also note that he is an Aspen Fellow. Um, and then finally, to, my, to his left as well, is Luis Betancourt, who is a professor of complex systems at the Santa Fe Institute, uh, the world's foremost think tank on complexity, um, where he's particularly focused now on uh, cities and uh, cities and, and urbanization um, and sort of the emerging subfield of the science of cities. Um, he was trained as a theoretical physicist, uh, and for those of you who went to Jeff West's session this morning on science of cities, you should know that all of Jeff's works, all of the papers it's based on, Louise's name comes first on the papers. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, I will dive in. And I guess the first question I want to direct um, to Kennedy. I want to get a sense of the fact that, you know, it's one thing for all of us to be here in Aspen and talk about the challenge of megacities and talk about the challenge of slums, but you were the person who grew up in it. You were the person who sees it firsthand and the challenges people face there. And so I was hoping you could talk a bit about, I guess, your, to start, your experiences growing up in Canberra how you created you know, uh, Shining Communities, and then I guess sort of talk about the services you render and what are the greatest challenges facing residents of Kibera and Mathari now? Thank you so much, yeah. So maybe I should start by how I ended up in Kibera. So my, my, my parents left the village in Western Kenya to Nairobi looking for jobs and opportunity. Then they came to Nairobi, there was no job. They were not educated. And housing is a problem, so they ended up in a place called Kibera, the slum. So that, be, that become a place where they can at least can afford. So that's where I grew up from the age when I was a one year old. I mean, and Kibera can be compared to Central Park. You know, it lives over a million people. Life is so hard; it's not really re recognized by the government, and that makes it so hard. Whereby there is no title deed, it become a problem. And another issue is hopelessness. So there's no roads, you know, so there's no government services inside. So that became a very big issue. So at the age of 10, I became a homeless kid because there was no food in the house. Life was so hard. And I stayed on the street for two years. So later on, seeing my friend dying, little girls at the age of 11, trading their body for food was a big issue, you know. And until one day, I read a book of Martin Luther King Jr. that really inspired me, and I saw hope. So that's when I was working in a factory, earning one dollar for 10 hours. I bought a soccer ball just to start a movement that the community can change their own life. And that's how I started. Interesting. I, as, as part of that, I mean, how, is, how has Kibera changed since you were a child there? I mean, I, I know one of the classic cases about Kibera now is that for years it was left off of the official maps, like Google Maps would render Kibera as a blank gray zone, as if it was nothing there. And, and people have now mapped it since then. Um, but how is, how is the city, how has the Kibera evolved? How has the infrastructure evolved, the housing? Um, you know, is it, is it a growing, thriving place that will eventually become developed? Or is it still hopeless as people like it is still It is still a hard, hard place because people, people are still coming in from the rural areas to urban looking for jobs, and they end up in, in Kibera. As a little boy, there used to be spaces in Kibera. Right now, you can't find space. So it's continued growing. And that's a challenge that we have to work on as a whole, yeah. Well, I want, to go to, I want to go to Luis next because one of the things that you brought, I think one of the biggest challenges around megacities, particularly developing world megacities in the global south, which is that they are the arrival zones for this tidal wave of immigration, people who are coming from villages often with no real connections to the city. And so this ties into the whole discussion of what is a city? Is a city infrastructure? Is a city the sum total of its buildings? 
Um, Luis, you've done really interesting work arguing that cities are social networks and that basically for any city to succeed, it's going to require understanding how those networks tie together and, and integrating people. And so I was hoping right. to talk about your research. So, uh, so cities are all these things, as you just said, Greg. So, but fundamentally, when you go to a very poor city or a very old city, there's a certain sense in which it's about people being able to connect with each other to gain opportunity, to gain a job, to gain <coughs> access to learning, to have, you know, to do all the things that we do in life, access to healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, all, that's an urban life, and that's in some sense what people hope to have from coming to the city. Uh, there's, a, there's a sense in which I am, so uh, just sort of to complement a little bit what you say and justify my being here, we, we've, we've had a pro uh, project now uh, for about almost two years with Slum Dwellers International. They're a federation of people who reside in slums and they have a process by which they basically uh, do self-census of their own community. So they do a census, they measure how many people live there, how they live, incomes, infrastructure, quality of services. And the idea is exactly to address what you said, Greg. It's this idea that in order for life to get better, in order for people to be able to stay there, they need to be seen, they need to be visible, they need to be official. And there are ways now, the extraordinary thing, there have always been ways, but there are better ways now of being visible through information, through being mapped, through having facts about you, about the neighborhood. And these facts are being created by communities. After all, they're the only ones that really can know that. So there's a sense in which all these places are cities in formation. They're cities, they're not quite what you described. They're not yet completely well-formed social networks where everyone has access to all the things that city can in principle offer, but they're just starting to happen. And then the final question is, can that happen quicker and in a better way, perhaps in a more sustainable way, or are these places sometimes hopeless, to use your word? Well, Shreesh, I want to come to I want to come to you because you know obviously India is operating scale where you know tremendous amount of informal settlements. I mean, you know, Dharavi is probably in Mumbai the most famous slum in the world because of Slum Dog Millionaire. Um, although I'm curious, you know, what are, what are the alternatives to you know to basically slums and uh, permitting slums to grow? You know, India for years, of course, fought urbanization, tried to keep people in the village, which I think is conceded to be a failure now, particularly what it meant for the economy. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's an ambitious, India has an incredibly ambitious urban building program called the Nelly, Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor, which, if I recall correctly, is a dozen new cities of two million people or more, seven international airports, multiple ports, uh, and a gigantic program of urban expansion. Um, so can we build cities from scratch? Can we try to skip over the informal settlement and go right to the formal city? India, it seems India would like to try. Many questions, uh, difficult answers. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> As we were looking at India as well as uh, other emerging countries, uh, just a couple of statistics uh, in the next, uh, the, the big numbers that you mentioned, uh, urban population grows, 40% of that growth is going to come from India and China, and 60% of the rest of the world, right? Uh, so therefore, how to think through the developing market uh, urbanization is a, is a very important topic. The problem is that if you look at one particular solution that always appears attractive. But when you take the complete mass, which is 300 million people are going to move in India, for example, in the next 20 years uh, in urban areas, how do, you, how do you really manage it for 300 million people? Not half a million people, not 100,000 people. So lots of examples are about small, uh, distinct islands of excellence. That doesn't work. So as we started looking at what I call the mass balance, the mass balance is here is very important. Otherwise, you will go to India, Indonesia, Bangladesh. By the way, I just want to take a quick uh, round of hands. How many of you have been either to India, Bangladesh, or Indonesia? Okay, so this is a this is a well-traveled great <laughs> crowd, uh, yeah. well-traveled well audience, right? I I particular purposely took those three countries, and I didn't take China uh, into uh, example. The mass balance of urbanization is uh, as follows, right? Uh, so if 300 million people are going to move, 60% of them are earning less than dollar a day per capita. Okay. So one dollar per day per capita, 60%. Now you think about the issue that now you want to, let's say, provide housing. Okay, housing in this market costs some 100 times their monthly income, so simply unaffordable, right? So as you start looking at the mass balance of money, nobody's talking. We may not be talking about money, but the mass balance of money, it's, it's very clear that there's a huge gap. 
In India, it's $400 billion, okay, $400 billion out of the $1.2 trillion of expenditure that is required. So the mass balance doesn't work unless you come up with innovative solutions. Otherwise, slum is the right way to go because there is no other solution, right? So the way it has to work, and Singapore that way is a perfect example, even though it's a small city. How do you really create the mass balance of money? So how do you cross-subsidize? How do you use taxes? How do you use land monetization? At least in our mind, on paper, the mass balance works. Mm -hmm. So it's not an unsolvable problem. The mass balance works both in money as well as infrastructure. One other point, this, these new cities, at least we have found, is that is a false solution. You, know, you cannot get 300 million people in, settled in new cities. You know? So therefore, it has to be existing cities. And the opportunity here, of course, that's the problem. The opportunity, which I, is one of my favorite quotes, is to say that 70% of these cities are not yet built. So if you think from a climate change, housing perspective, this is the opportunity. This is the opportunity. Because retrofitting a Los Angeles or New York is one. But 70% of India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, that is not built. If we can put the energy solutions and so on right up there. And the mass balance of money works. Can, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Sharice, I think we have to change our mentality a little bit on, on how we see development in terms of the, 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 the urban. You see, the, why people earning $1 per day? I mean, when we go there, most of the time we are in a box. So understand that when we want to change the slums, we have to, they are needing opportunity. Yeah. And we can get opportunities whereby these people can even earn more than a dollar. Yes. You know I mean? So uh, therefore, if we say that these people in the slum, they earn $1, therefore it will be difficult to build them houses, we are wrong. How do we find integrated solution? Because mm -hmm. what's happening is that, sorry, these guys, when you see, is a class war. It's a class war in my, in my country. You know, people living under one dollar, people living under one dollar, and there's a wall. It's like those people, you know what I mean? They are looking for opportunities. How can we create jobs in Islam? Yes. How can we have better housings? You know what I mean? So let's stop and start thinking in the integrated approach, holistic way. Well, I want to go back to Luis. I want to go with you on this one because you know because the the if you boil down your work with Jeff West to a nutshell, I saw I saw Tony Shea say this in, in Denver this week. You know, where he actually conflated you guys with Ed Glazer. Uh, and I knew you'd reach the mainstream where he was attributing ideas to, uh, your ideas to Ed Glazer. But the notion if we double the size of a city, it's not only twice as good as it was, but it gains 15%. And so therefore we should, which if you do that stupidly, you basically we should just double all cities. But if you, you know, if you double the size of London, you may get that 15% gain. I doubt that if you double the size of Lagos, you're going to get that gain. So what is the difference? Is it infrastructure? Is it transport? Uh, you know, what, what, what do these cities need and mega cities need to do that? And is there any upward limit on the size that cities can be? Because this is another discussed topic. So many questions there again. I mean, I think these, the essential answer to all those questions is that you have to understand what a city is in terms of forming as a social economic network of people with opportunities, with ways to make a living across all the dimensions of life. And that means services and infrastructure. I'll get to there in a second. And so uh, when we see that, when we find this sort of 15% uh, effect, it's really comparing cities that were able to do that. Mm -hmm. So when you, this is why it's so important, but also so interesting uh, to look at cities in formation, these mega cities that are going so fast that in some sense have not realized all that potential and require many transformations, social, political, economic, civic, but also infrastructural to achieve that. So that's what's happening there. And that's what allows us to perhaps understand those processes. So what's the answer? So I'm gonna provide sort of a larger abstraction. And excuse me, please. Uh, so what happens when, so we, we collect uh, with our partners at Slum Dwellers International data from about 18 countries, almost 33 countries at different levels of detail. Uh, and what you find is basically, we've not had this opportunity to actually look at neighborhood level, poor neighborhoods, rich neighborhoods, formal and informal, and see what is the social dynamics that happens at that level. How do, how do you have development? Also, how do you find integration? What is the role of services? Essentially, to simplify something very complicated, what happens is that if you have a very poor informal neighborhood, people build their own shelter, people are the infrastructure. They're surviving and they're carrying the water, right, getting rid of the waste, building their own shelter, etc. And so that's what they're doing with their time and effort. They're just surviving in place. And that is not what creates economic growth and creates innovation, creates all these other great things that we associate in cities. People are just surviving. So what's the answer? The answer is then a process by which people can become full-fledged socioeconomic agents. 
that improves their life. So it's an integrated solution by which you start having services, formalization of space, security of tenure so that you can stay in place, you can invest in your house even if you build it yourself or somebody else can invest in it. You start getting services so that you don't have to carry the water so that you can save time and you can use that time to learn, to fi go find a job, et cetera, et cetera. So there's sort of a cycle in which when you're very poor, to talk to your question too, Shirish, there's a sense in which when you're very poor, you pay for things with your time, not with your money. What you have is time and you survive. You are the infrastructure. So, and you shift this, just to finish the thought, yeah. towards a life that's familiar, I'm sure, to all of you, where you pay for services with your money and you're a socioeconomic agent that procures that money that's creative, that generates economic growth. So, so Candy, how's that worked in practice? Because this is exactly, exactly your work. So how did you choose the program uh, when you started setting up the services of Shining Oak for Community? Okay, uh, to, to maybe before I go back, I want to talk about this a little bit. So no, but what we are also forgetting is that they're living at places like squatters. Absolutely. There's, there's no title deeds. Right. So, I mean, so it's really a dilemma, you know, it's really, it's, it's hard exactly. to say, you know, because you want to build a house, as you say, but at the same time, you don't own the land. Exactly. So the, the solution yeah. starts with the, just to have with the government and the communities together. I mean, anyway, so to answer your question was that I saw the, the, the struggle in the community and I realized that for any society that can grow, they have to respect women. And my mother really suffered a lot, you know, uh, having me in Kibera. And we are eight kids, you know what I mean? So I thought that to, for, for us to do this, that how we have to find a way whereby we have integrated approach. So we built a school for girls that became the center and we're able to connect to other social services, like clinic, you know what I mean? Does in a grassroots level. We have clean water, like that, you know? And I also believe the solution will also come by working with the private sector. It's, you know, it's not only government. <laughs> you have to be clear there, it's not only government. It has to be done by all partners. I, I just wanted to uh, debate a bit that this point you brought up, which is how big is too big. I think it's a false dilemma, uh, because it all de de depends on the definition of a city. Would you call New York to Washington DC as one city, that entire corridor? Obviously not, right? So in our mind, the cities and the governance architecture can be, it can be looked at as a series of interconnected uh, communities, right? Uh, and you can break them into manageable lots. Okay, everybody does that, right? So for me, Mumbai to Pune could be a 100 million people corridor. 100 million, okay, I'm not talking about 20, 30, 60. It may have 15 governance councils, okay, mayoral or whatever, and then they will, they will deliver their own local solutions. Okay, so for me, uh, you can, you, there is definitely an economy of scale, mm -hmm. but that does not mean that there is an upper limit in terms of the traditional way of looking at how big is too big. Well, just to back, I would, I would push you on this because yeah. we're, so far we've approached this topic through an Indian, uh, Nairobi, African yeah. lens, and so, I want to come back to your point that building cities from scratch will not work because this is exactly the strategy that China has taken. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if you saw today's New York Times, I believe it was today's Times, uh, on Tianjin where they're building their own version of Manhattan from scratch mm -hmm. and it's a ghost city. Although that said, the, the story also points out the previous ghost cities like the new CBD yeah. in Zhengzhou are packed. And yes. so can it work? Can, can the Chinese do it because it's a command economy and then sort of, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the population size is enough that it will happen? I mean, they have a gigantic urbanization campaign, which yes. they're forcing via Huku. So is that doomed to fail? Or will no, no, no. I, I, I do believe that you can build new cities. I have a I have problem with notion that it's in the middle of nowhere, and then you're going to eventually populate it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, uh, new cities, the, those greenfield cities, I think, at least in, in the Indian context, only 25 million of the 300 million you can put. But as the cities expand, I give the example of Mumbai to Pune as just one example, right? I, the, you can consider those as a series of quote unquote new cities because there's nothing in between. But it's an extension of an existing city. That's what I believe in far more. It's an extension of Mumbai on one side and Pune on the other side, right? So uh, to get back to that point and then to stress something you said, I think that it's very hard for anyone from the outside, let alone us judging you know, Mumbai or any other city about whether it's too big. I think in some sense it's too big when people stop coming. Uh, and, and that is kind of a very uncomfortable definition because maybe we think it's too big for other reasons, but that's really the ultimate reason. In some sense, maybe Detroit is too big or, or the city of Detroit is too big or the ghost town is too big. But, but it really speaks to the formation of the socioeconomic city versus the physical buildings, roads, city. And, and, and that is really difficult. And this stresses your point. So what I want to go is that there's the sense in which the solution 
to creating a city that's uh, vital, growing, prosperous, and healthy socioeconomic system is along many dimensions at once. It's integrated. It is essential that people have security of their tenure, they can stay, that they have maybe a title deed or some other way of staying such that they can build their lives up so that they can do other things. But you need to get all kinds of things right, like all the things that you have to do in your life. You need to have water and food and a place to live. You need to be able to have transportation. All these things anyone needs in order to be able to go to school or to get a job or to search for a job or to make an invention. So if any of those things fail, everything fails. And that's the problem, is that it, there's no magic bullet. When titles came up, and this was a good idea, it seemed, that helps, but it's not enough to just create a magic bullet that gets the process of human development in, uh, uh, going. So this is also why it's not very easy to command from City Hall or from any other centralized place, because you need to get many things going. In, even in our own neighborhoods in developed cities, we've solved the physical and infrastructural aspects of the problem, but we continue to have neighborhoods that are very poor because the socioeconomic, the segregation and so forth, these issues are not are much more subtle and they're not fully addressed. Yeah, so I agree with you on that, yeah. So another point I wanna maybe stress is that when we talk about mega cities, when we talk about informal settlement, sometimes it seems like it's not you, it's something else. But this is how I see it. I see a problem because it becomes our own problem. Population grows, more people become in the slums, insecurity, I mean, and the same way I discuss this in Kenya is to tell them that, you know, if we don't work on this, it's a time bomb, you know? Something's gonna happen. You cannot have a group of people with, with skills and at the age of 20, and they are 60%. You know what I mean? That is dangerous, unless we start working on this. And how do we work on this? I think we have to work together whereby we need the private sector, we need the government, policymakers like you, and other people, so that we can all be involved. I have an example in Kibera whereby the UN Habitat, forgive me, mm -hmm. and my government <laughs> tried to build upgrading. It failed, because they forget that there is a culture in communities. They forget that there's, a, there's informal economy that people depend on. So when you are doing these structures, let's remember those two things, culture and the informal economy. Mm -hmm. So nobody leaving those houses. So it became a terrible idea. Well, let's back to, you, I, you know, I, I can start with Kennedy, I'm, here, I'm curious to hear the other two. What should the role of government be in this, or what can we actually expect from that? I mean, we don't want them planning entire cities from scratch, so we don't want the very high end. But at the same time, you know, we also don't want them to basically deny land tenure and ignore completely. So when we're talking about mega urbanization, what, what can we reasonably expect from governments able to keep up with this sort of growth? I mean, you know, should they be planning only infrastructure? Should, what kind of governance do we need? I'm curious thoughts on this of how, how you would manage a city of 10 or 20 million people where you have multiple cores, multiple neighborhoods. You know, how do you bind that together and how do you plan for that kind of expansion? Yeah, my, my sense is the government has an integral and 80 to 90% role to play. I am not a big believer as I see situation on the ground on the ability of private sector to do things on their own in this context, okay? They can build buildings, but a lot of this has to come together by a well-planned city. While I am against planning greenfield cities, I'm a big believer in planning for the next 50 years. Like Singapore was planned at a two million population to six million population, including the corridors and so on. And we still give examples of Manhattan how the transportation corridors were planned 100 years before and how, how, the, how the whole city went around that, okay? So there's a big role in planning. There's a big role in money. Where does this money come from? Private sector is, while they can provide the capital, they, they need a return, right? So there's a very, very important role to play for the government, especially in emerging markets, okay? Extraordinarily important. The minute you lose that, the minute you start saying, it's all stakeholders, it's all communities, private sector, this, that. I think you undersolve the problem, unfortunately. It, of course, there's a very important role for private sector, very important role to communities, but the government, especially in these mega cities, has an extraordinarily important role to play. Kenny, do you think the, the Kenyan government has any interest in playing that role? <laughs> you know what I think? Uh, I, get to, I got your point, you know, but at the same time, a little bit I differ. Because yeah. I think, uh, let's talk about this. I think these things happen differently. I, I, I think the, ch the China and Africa is different. But how I think is this that we live in a community. What is happening that 
people on the grassroots level are not involved. That's why you are building a, you know what I mean? So you are building something that people in the community doesn't understand. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying, like, listen. Government sh should work with the community. What, what about private sector? How do they come in? Architectures, companies, you know what I mean? For example, in Kenya, if we community come together and say, okay, this, we want this space of the land, we want to build our own houses, government give us the title deed, private sector are also involved, community, the labor, you know what I mean? In that way, I think we're going to have the best cities. But if we ignore, we're going to have a big problem. Mm -hmm. So, may I? So, I think this is actually gets to the, to, the, to the soul of the problem, the essence of the problem, is that it's clear that in cities, government does play a role, but it cannot determine everything that happens. And in fact, all the knowledge about the problems and the best solutions exist with people in their neighborhoods. That's where it is. So, uh, we just wrote a paper, actually, that actually makes this contrast. Uh, in urban planning, a lot of people are trained as thinking of the exercise of doing urban planning as design. You design the shape of the city. You may design some of the functionalities of a transportation network, perhaps. But you imagine sort of the blueprint, you know, to caricature it a little bit. And that's what your job is, is to do that. Maybe zone part, different parts of the city, et cetera. And uh, the argument is that that's not what urban planning actually is in terms of solving these problems. It should be essentially more of a coordination problem. It's a problem of finding the information from people and communities about what's most needed, what's most helpful, and of enabling those activities under the budget and the constraints that the city knows about. But this is really hard to do because the urban planner sitting in City Hall has no idea about what's happening, particularly in a slum. They really don't, they don't and know. how could they? <laughs> But at the same time, of course, the slum dweller, who may know very well what their lives is like, and perhaps a lot about their neighborhood, has also not a great idea about what the city could, even in the best of all worlds, do. Right? So the question is, how do you bring agency and knowledge about these different things together in order to create the best possible solution? And how is it that over time you keep on creating better and better and better solutions? So you see, this is part of how we, we try to see the work we're doing in all these places we, and, and the work that SDI has been doing now for 30 years, which is a way of enacting, uh, of, of elicitating knowledge from the communities about their priorities, the quality of their services, what they think is most useful, and using that information, which now is quantitative, as a census thing, that an urban planner or a mayor can understand. It's very hard for the mayor to go to, a, to also a community and say, what do you want? or to have town, you know, a town meeting. That's sort of a nightmare for the politician, right? It's very democratic, but then you know, you get a very, very biased set of who shows up and what people want. So really, you have to construct a process by which you get the right information that enables the process of building the best possible <laughs> solutions under the budget that you have, and keep going, keep on improving no, life. I just feel that this is a very, if I may, 30 seconds. Uh, it's a very, very developed market thinking, okay, if I may say so. Because we do this uh, yeah. only in Africa, <laughs> no, we don't do this in the US. No, what, what I mean by that is the budget that you talk about right. is one hundredth of what is required. Right, right. So you can, of course, work very closely with the communities, but right. then you provide only one hundredth of what is required right. in water, in transportation, in jobs, in, in all types of things, right? So therefore, again, I, I completely agree with the process of that it is the solutions that have to come out, but the mass balance has to work. No, but the help, it works gradually. The, the risk, I think the mistake is to think that, that you have to get to a certain level where you have a certain budget that you build no, a no. Certain, to a certain standard. I think what the informality of slums in their economies, in their ways of building, in the way people live, uh, this informal process is a process by which cities actually exist. It is the soul, it is the origin. Of, of social life, really. It is informal. But this process has a way of evolving and becoming formalized. Uh, and then if you all agree that, we agree that we have a crisis. Mm -hmm. We really have a crisis in the, actually in the development world. Why we have this crisis? The smart people, <laughs> the big ideas, they don't want to go back to the people. Mm -hmm. As we get these big ideas, sometimes may not work. You know what I mean? So what I'm That's suggesting is that we have to find an idea, where, we have to find a way whereby we have the ideas that we can either work with them on the grassroots level. What's going to happen? You're going to build cities that nobody's going to live in. You're going to build cities that people are going to burn it down. In Kibera now, what's happening? There's a clash between the government and the community. 
Because people forget that the community are not just community. They have local leaders. You got it? And then we talk about like, you don't make them they're being like objects. Yeah, government will come, we're gonna build your houses. You don't have voice. You are just poor. No. You are important, you are a human being. You live here, you understand your economy, you understand your culture. Let's work together with the government. And we can also teach the government sometimes. We'll teach the government how to do it. And if I may add, <laughs> I think this, what Kennedy just said, is development. Development is a, is, is a capacity of a society to solve problems gradually, but towards uh, uh, improvement, the greater end in economic growth and human development. And it has to come, it has to, you know, going back to the social network that integrates everybody. It's people at the neighborhood level, at the community level, that have the information about what's most crucial. And so, the, but there's a sense in which that has to come through the uh, process. Yeah. But I, don't, I, I, yeah, I want said. to make sure, I completely agree, but I want to make sure that the big opportunity that we have, mm -hmm. which is 70% of the cities are not yet built, right. and they will get built in the next 40 years by your own numbers, 2015 right, right. to 2050. And some of these solutions need to come together. Of course, gradual process, that's the way cities happen. But some of these solutions need to come together now. And India is thinking very hard about it. Bangladesh is thinking very hard about it. Indonesia is thinking hard about it. And there, is, there are a set of top-down solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, how, the, how are taxes, for example, put between cities and villages? You know, it's a fundamental decision that a government has to take. If 25% if of taxes are shared directly with cities, all infrastructure works. If it doesn't, you can, you can improve only gradually, and so on and so on. So therefore, I, while, while I completely agree with a set of uh, interactive sol developmental solutions, there are a set of top-down solutions that need to be made to work. Well, before we go to uh, the audience questions, just a second, I want to go back to, to Kennedy and the least unchallenge that then. I mean, you know, considering that classically development, at least since World War II, you know, the notion of, of helping poor benighted societies has been based on let's find best practices and then we'll scale them up. Should we, when it comes to urbanization and developing cities, cities self-developing, auto-catalyzing cities, as my friend Benjulita Pena puts it, um, should we resist the notion that any of it's scalable? Is it all at the micro-community level, that every community is going to have to solve its own problems and its own development? Or this goes back to the government idea. I mean, Kennedy, if I gave you the budget now, would, would you start branches in every major slum across Africa? And if you did, would it work? Yes. All right. It's by working with the communities. Yeah. You know yes. what I mean? And then, you know, they always will tell you about, I don't know, in uh, some countries in Asia that started top down, you know. But honestly, it doesn't work. You know, what we have, the world has been lost. We have to go back to our roots. We have to go back to listen. People are not listening. And that's become a, 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 very, a, very, a very big issue. I believe that solutions are in the communities. The only thing that they don't have is lack of opportunities. If you give them the same opportunities, they will excel. And they're going to build their own. Yeah. Great. So, <laughs> well, all right. So we can start. We have, some, we have at least one question out there. I know there's microphones around. Can we get a mic over to this gentleman? Might as well open it up for the audience. I run an organization called Project for Public Spaces. And we do something called placemaking. And we work all over the world. And we have a partnership with the UN Habitat. And where they're moving to 2016 is moving towards place governance place-led placemaking. And we have a conference in Buenos Aires in September where the topic is streets as public spaces. So this, the public spaces of streets varies in all kinds of communities, but they can become dynamic centers of activity if you take it from the grassroots, you get to something that's special for each community. So a street, instead of just being about traffic, is about place. What do you think of that? direction because the, we're developing the language that will go into 2016 Habitat 3. Um, sure, I'll try to give a quick answer. So uh, thank you for your work, which I'm a big fan of, by the way. But uh, I, I would say that if you go to uh, Nairobi or, many, uh, or Mumbai or many other places, you'll see that the streets are exactly what you want them to be. They're places where, with a lot of social life, and there's a little bit of a sense in which us, through urban renewal in the 60s and 70s, maybe China now with its own policy, which is a lot like urban renewal, is creating, is looking at streets really as more a circulatory system for cars. So there's a sense in which public spaces are the essence of the city. 
uh, we are sort of pushed out of our private spaces into the public space that the city is as cities get larger and more developed. And so that's, that's the, the really important space, the civic and economic and, and social space of the city. What that is in detail now cuts a lot finer and depends a lot on technologies, how we move around, that we need to accommodate the cars after all, what are good spaces for interaction, what are spaces of serendipity to you, Greg. Uh, and I think there's a lot to learn about that. There's been uh, amazing work that's been done over the decades, but I think there's a lot of work that should be done towards I, I, making that better. I just want to add to that. I, yeah, I'm in my talk tonight. Um, please come, Engineering Serendipity at the Limelight at 5.30. Um, I, I, I'm, really, I'm really interested in the work by the Mumbai-based architecture collective Crit, which wrote a great uh, essay called Being Nicely Messy. And they look particularly at the streets of Dharavi and in Mumbai, uh, where these public spaces, because they are public, cannot be parceled out, cannot have land rights assigned to them, and so it has a much higher density of interaction and entrepreneurship in the, in the public streets than you could ever get in a more formalized city. And so you know, they call this, you know, this notion of the blur of public and private in the streets, and it gives cities what they also call the higher transactional capacities, and that's what leads to greater cities. So I think that's fantastic. Um, now back to my moderator role. We have more questions in the back. Uh, there's a lady there, and then another one in the back, and then we'll come back up. You've talked a lot about, the, or you've used the word neighborhood and the word community a lot. And we know that uh, 100 million people is not a community, but I wonder, is there a size, a maximum or minimum even, that we can assign to a community? And what's the connection between that and local or layers of government? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, John. No, so you're exactly right, 100 million people is not a community and you know, uh, the community starts from the neighborhood to, uh, to all the way up to a uh, large city. But at least the governance unit, and this we can debate what is the governance unit that works uh, for us somewhere, and this is, I'm talking about mega cities now, okay, somewhere in a half a million uh, people, uh, a ward as it's called, or a borough as it's called in London you know, or so on, is a, is a decent governance unit. There must be, I'm sure you need to go down, okay, and you need to take what I call neighborhood by neighborhood, but on a governance unit, that coming together at a mayoral level of around 8, 10 million people, and then 10, 15, 20 million people, and then as you start going beyond that, then you need to just multiply this type of thing, is the, the thought that was going on in terms of the governance architecture of large cities. You want to? Well, uh, so just very quickly, I don't think that there's a simple answer to that. I think that, uh, for example, we, we work with doing census of slum neighborhoods. We ask our partners, how do you decide that that's the neighborhood? And the answer is, which resonate a little bit with something you said, Kennedy, is the, the size of the neighborhood is basically set by the emergence of leadership that's accepted by the people. And that's about, tends to be about one, 2,000 people. Uh, and you know, when, fast forward, when you look at neighborhoods in our own cities in the United States, so in Europe or in Japan, how well do you know your neighbors? I think actually you tend to see, and you know, there's uh, literature about bemoaning how we lost contact with our local neighborhood and so forth, and how this neighborhood's more diffuse, but you just see this when you analyze social networks of people that live basically in conditions where they have to provide services, they need to help each other, there's a lot tighter local community, as you move to cities that are better serviced, where we have sort of a more diffuse socioeconomic life, then you have that the unit actually is larger, but it's not as connected. Uh, and so, you know, there's a certain sense in which you are a New Yorker or you are from New Mexico, and those are larger and larger scales, but those units are more diffuse, and they're not enabling the same dynamics, the same agency to solve problems. Yeah, and I want to add is that when you think big sometimes, it's overwhelming. When I was growing up in Kibera, you see the poverty. You see people say that people over a million people live there. Nobody can bring change. You are like, you are tired of it. But I knew that change starts from individual to community, to the society. And in that way, we're going to have a big impact. What scares people most of the time is that you see the problem as a big thing. Let's start, start thinking in a community way. Because that way, you start by community, it grows slowly by slowly. And that's how we're going to have the change. All right, more questions. We had, uh, well, had someone else. Can we get one over here on the wing, please? Hi, uh, not to oversimplify, but it sounds like one of the solutions here is much more of a top-down approach, the other is a bottom-up approach, and the third is more of a collaboration approach. Um, I was curious, each of you comes from the perspective of very different scales, 
one much larger than the others, and also from three very different cultures. Would you say that your perspectives are more defined by the scale that you're coming from, or the culture, or a balance of both? I'd, I'd like Louise to take this first, because this goes back to your work on whether culture actually matters in urban development in historical time frames. So I don't know if you, this is a cue for you to talk about that. You know, I think we're all trying not to be too steeped in our own cultures, though we're informed by it. You know, uh, much of what I do uh, is basically trying to analyze data and make it as, you know, as, as impersonal as possible about what is the nature of this problem. Uh, in this area, actually, one of the issues is that we've never had a way of accumulating information and knowledge around the process of development. So everyone has a solution, particularly in policy organizations. But as Kennedy was pointing out, the top-down solutions tend to be not be sustainable, meaning they don't last over time, and of course not sustainable often in other ways. But also, so there, there's a, a, a whole set of soft evidence about what things, when things work and don't work. Um, I think that, you know, when I was saying that planning and solution making is a coordination problem across scales, it really is because of what all that we said and all this evidence. You know, the community cannot solve certain problems by themselves. They can organize themselves better and do certain things locally. But issues of sanitation or crime, for example, tend to be very difficult for the community to deal with. At the same time, when you look at the city, the mayor, the planner, they really have no idea about what each individual's life is like and what are the biggest problems, particularly in informal neighborhoods. How could they? So, so there's a sense in which they need that information, that agency, in order to do a good job. So I think that, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, speaking to, to my point of view of this coordination of action and information being the crucial aspect of planning and development, I think that it recognizes agency at these different levels and at the same time emphasizes the need for the connection between them. As you develop, as a lot of these problems get automatic, you don't think about your water service or where your power comes from, et cetera. Or maybe in this audience you do, but you know, most of us don't think about that daily. Then the problem migrates to the problems of governance and government, what it does, and school boards and so forth. But in the beginning, it's a lot really about solving very fine problems in ways that are possible with very small budgets, in ways that are small but make a big difference in people's lives. And you have to know a lot about them to do, the, yeah, to do them right. I agree with you. And to answer that is that, let's be clear, this is the healthy panel I've ever seen. Somebody from Kibera Slam sitting down here. So, so that, what does that mean? It means that we believe in partnership. Mm -hmm. If we can all put all these ideas together, yeah. we're going to have biggest change. Exactly. What's happening now is that there's only one idea. It's policymakers. This is how it's done. You guys don't understand it. But if we work together as we are here today now, we're going to change these problems. We're going to have a big impact. So I'm for partnership. I've seen, what, I've seen the power of partnership in my community. Seriously. Kibera alone cannot do it. Government alone cannot do it. Police, policy makers alone cannot do it. We have to do it together. Well, I would say creating those institutions then is going to exactly. be the biggest challenge of that. Other questions? Uh, we've got one right here then. Uh, <clears throat> My colleagues and I work in the area of urban agriculture, and it's a good example of some of the inefficiencies and imperfections uh, that you're talking about. And we would come down on the coordination side very heavily because we find, on the one hand, that local communities have, and I'm talking particularly neighborhoods in that sense, uh, have very different kinds of network institutional structures embedded in them, and that the people living there in there have incredible entrepreneurial skills. They simply aren't enabled to access those in the, in the city marketplace. On the other end, the developers, the, the central planners, have a very disconnected view, and they have a toolbox of techniques that doesn't even include urban agriculture, not just as a sector for planning, but as a solution to multiple other programs, problems like women's empowerment, child nutrition, uh, developing institutional skills for democracy. What I would like to know is how do we take this collaboration or this collaboration approach and actually get in the hands of planners not just the skill set but the motivation to look very clearly at what these communities have to offer and at the same time recognize that peri-urban or quote slum informal settlement developments are not all alike, and you can't use just a best practices model. 
you have to have a disaggregated best practices model that looks at different kinds of informal settlements and then add your cultural piece from the bottom because they're the people who are going to make it work. And to me, that's the collaborative approach. Well, it sounds like we have to blow up the entire development industrial <laughs> complex and then we go from there. Um, so what, after we do that, where do we start? Anyone? <laughs> okay. I think so I didn't do on top. <laughs> no, so I, th I think it's already happening, to be fair. I think uh, when you look at the United States increasingly planning, tries to do that, and I emphasize try because it's difficult, uh, through participatory planning and so forth. So they're, you know, they're trying to elicitate information from the community about proposed solutions, working or not working, you know, being things that people want or not. I think that process at the moment is very clumsy and it's open to being hijacked by all kinds of social dynamics of who shouts the loudest and so forth. And so the challenge really is, I would say sort of going, you know, uh, megacon scientist and say, let's step back a little bit and think about what is it that we're missing. We're missing a way of getting the best information possible, trying the best solution possible, iterate that process, and then follow it over time because one of the issues with planning and policy in particular, because of electoral cycles and many other things, is that we don't see the result play out over long times. And when we're talking about socioeconomic things, we're talking about a generation sometimes, 20 years, 10 years, for a neighborhood to change. So um, I think what is encouraging is that the mentality certainly is changing in that direction, and we now have the technology to do this. Much easier to actually collect information about services, whether they're broken today or they're fixed tomorrow, uh, have some information that a lot of informal communities will tell you about how that service impacted your life in terms of allowing you to have time to maybe do agriculture, have better nutrition, or to find a job. But that kind of work to actually put the information together, formalize it, and compare it across many cases is not being done. It's just starting and needs to be formalized in that so that we don't hijack these processes of trying to talk to each other um, and, and to give up on them. If you like the answer to that question, come again tomorrow morning to see Luis again <laughs> at, at Cities and Big Data, where we'll discuss that. Um, uh, let's see, question in the back there, that gentleman there. Uh, this is for Luis. Um, first of all, the conversation's been really nice and human and, and talking about government and communities. But just in the pure math, if we're talking about agent-based systems, mm -hmm. scalability, and talking 40 years in the future, Aren't avalanches and phase transitions going to make this totally unpredictable in ways that are pretty catastrophic? Uh, yes, and it's a good thing, uh, except the catastrophic part. I think that what cities create is, is the dynamics of creating new things, um, both good and bad. Um, I think it's very hard to control that system through design or through politics. I think you shouldn't try to control it. But the question, I think, the question why we need better knowledge, including scientific knowledge, about cities is that it, I sometimes use the metaphor of the moonshot, and uh, forgive me, but let me just say, say this very quickly. Could you have gone to the moon without no, having the laws of gravity in motion? Sure. If you had powerful enough thrusters and ways of directing them, the moon's over there, you just kind of keep going till you get there. You don't need any science. So, but the point is, you know, and this is actually something I learned from Colin Harrison, who used to lead the IBM um, Smart Cities project, is that actually, if you didn't have the science, the engineering problem would be impossible. Because you would, if you do the calculation, you'd never have the thrusters and the kind of technology you do it. You'd not have done it in 69. You probably would, wouldn't have gone to the moon yet. So the challenge of cities and the need for knowledge is not that cities and urbanization are not happening, expressing good and bad things, but it's really the challenge of how is it that through policy, through participation, through good information, and through knowledge of what cities can do, nudge that process in order to realize the best and fastest human development, perhaps in one generation, we can change the world where there'll be little poverty, good health, and, and the pursuit of happiness being a reality for people, and not all the bad things in terms of pollution, lack of sustainability, and violence that cities can, can create. We don't know if there's a phase transition in there. We think from everything we've seen that this is a more continuous process, but it is very nonlinear. And so we need knowledge in order to be able to guide that process at all levels to, in the right direction and make it fast. I just want to step in, and we have one time for one last question after that, but I want to step in here. Isn't that an overly technocratic vision of the future? That seems to, to disregard politics, mm -hmm. 
the denialist atmosphere in the United States right now with regards to science. I mean, you can have science, but then you can choose to ignore it. Uh, not to mention, you know, racism, uh, class warfare, you know, uh, you know any, any of that. So isn't that, isn't that, that strikes me as a very 60s technocratic view. I, I think no. I, I think it would tell you, I think what the knowledge about cities and the good things they can do will tell you is that you should have integrated societies where everyone has a chance. That means that you shouldn't have segregation or any other kind of separating people from opportunities, for example. Uh, that also means that the role of government is really as being an enabler of the good things that city can do. You know, this is replying very abstractly. And a disabler of the bad things that people can do to each other and, and so forth. So government often plays a really important role in aggregating information and coordinating action in ways that no one else can do. Uh, but that role really has to be informed by a, an understanding of cities so that we can have more civilization more quickly. All right, time for one last question. We want to get, we need one more from the swing right here, please. All right, <clears throat> can you mention any relevant recent examples of cities that are dealing well with the challenges you've described today? Yes, what is the world's most successful megacity? At least in the global south. Would anyone choose to hazard, hazard a favorite? It's very hard to say, because there are many dimensions of this, and you do should talk about the cities you know much better than I do. I think there's a lot of creativity happening in South America, in the cities of Colombia, in the cities of Brazil. It's, uh, it's hit and miss, we've seen it in the news. But there's a lot of this idea, you know, that basically came from observations locally about uh, the needs to integrate poor neighborhoods and rich neighborhoods, of having civic services throughout the city, of mixing people, but also get, uh, creating the city as a space for uh, civic behavior that's constructive and not violent. Uh, I think a lot of cities that sort of mid-income countries are doing quite well. There's the gigantic housing projects in Brazil, South Africa, certain South, 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 South Asia countries that maybe you can talk more about. So there's a lot of change uh, that's in the positive direction, but, um, but I think the bad things are there too all along. So it's very hard to say in the moment, but I think I'm very optimistic that we're moving generally in the right direction. Yeah. <clears throat> As we were doing this McKinsey Global Institute project about uh, emerging cities, we looked throughout the world. One thing I can say, at least in India, I, <laughs> we couldn't come up with uh, one single example of, uh, of, a, of a city which is, which is doing well. Uh, so therefore, we started looking out. And as you said, different, uh, different uh, cities came differently, like the public housing program of Singapore uh, from the 1960s to the 2010. Fantastic, without slums. Of course, it's not a mega city per se because it's six, five to six million, million people. Yeah, I don't know whether the audience will like it, but uh, we were very impressed with a whole set of uh, examples from China. Okay, uh, while there were a set of issues, just the way it was built, the money was raised, the planning was done. Seoul was another example, again, uh, so on. Uh, we were not that impressed with many Latin American cities because they seemed very similar to the type of problems India, India was having and so on. So again, I'm sure there are lots of micro things, but as you look at a city as a whole, um, we didn't find too many, uh, too many examples of everything coming together. Kennedy are, you, are you, Kennedy, are you optimistic about Nairobi in the long run? Yeah, I think, uh, as I said before, if the, the government can, you know, they offer their title deeds to the communities uh, so that they can be able to thrive and as I say, working together, I think Nairobi will be really go, go do well. But at the same time, I'm also a little bit worried what's happening. If you look at the Brazil, look at, again, go to South Africa. It's not really paying if you, even if you are rich. You can't drive your car. You have to look for the what? <laughs> for the bulletproof windows, you know? That's what mm -hmm. I'm against that, you know? So to do that is by providing the opportunities, creating jobs for these marginalized people in the communities so that everybody can enjoy. Yeah, you know, so what we have now in Kenya is <laughs> majority working for the <laughs> minority. And, you know, we have the cooks, you know, for these houses, and yet we're not being paid well, we're not being listened to, you know. So for us to all go together, I think there's hope. If only policymakers, the smart people, are going to listen. Well, we, we can only hope. That might be too utopian <laughs> even for me. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Can I have a round of applause for our panelists? And I would encourage you all to keep coming to the, uh, the sessions of the Metropolis track. Uh, I'm speaking tonight at 5.30, and then Cities and Big Data tomorrow and more after that. So thank you.